Welcome to another RD Works Learning Lab. Today we're going to hopefully put a cap on all this dotty stuff that I've been working on for the past few weeks, months. I've lost track, but after a great deal of research that you've been involved with as well, I think I've come to a conclusion that I can put on a piece of paper to produce a formula or a formulaic system that will enable you to get almost perfect dot pictures. You'll have to decide whether or not that claim is successful by the time we get to the end of this session. But I've written down here what I call the Rust formula for successful photo engraving. And it is a two-page document which sets out all the steps in a very precise manner with some calculations which you must do and if you follow these rules you'll be guaranteed to get a good quality picture but at the moment I've only tested it on white card which basically I class as an organic material now other organic materials would be things like leather wood MDF things that burn basically now there is another group of materials which I haven't yet tested but we shall have to move into at some stage which are what I call mineral materials. Things like slate, glass, granite and then of course there is a third group of materials which basically contains only one material which is plastic, acrylic. Whether it be coloured acrylic or whether it be clear acrylic which is what most people will be using. So we've got these three groups and at the moment I'm only dealing with the organic group. But having said that, knowing what I know, I'm pretty confident that this procedure will work for all three groups. So today we're going to follow this procedure step by step. Now some of the steps in here will not need doing multiple times. You only need to do the, the step once to get the information. And once you've got that information about your machine, you can use that again and again and again. The very first thing that we've got to do is choose a lens. I would personally always want to go for the finest lens possible. It doesn't mean to say the most expensive lens, it means the lens with the smallest spot size that I can sensibly use on this machine. Now on this type of machine where we have the lens mounted down in the nozzle you can get a very very short focal length one and a half inch lens and that's what I'm using in this machine. On the light blade machine and maybe on your machine as well um, there's a different system. The lens is not mounted down here in the nozzle. The lens is actually mounted up here in the stem of this tube. Now there's a two inch lens sitting in there. I know that you can't get a one and a half inch lens system for this machine. But having said that, I have machined this nozzle out and I've adapted this to make a one and a half inch lens system that goes on the light blade machine. I don't have to worry about that today because I've already got a one and a half inch lens in here and that's what I would advocate you use. Two inch, yes, it will work, but you might not get such crisp results. Now the next thing you've got to do is you've got to choose the material that you're going to work with. Now today I'm going to be working with a very nice neutral material which is a piece of card that's about a millimetre thick but it works extremely well at, if you like, taking a good burn. Um, this is the sort of material that most of you guys will have experienced if you've um, spent a little bit of time in the pub because this is just like beer mat cardboard. Now we could use a nice white, I think that's a spruce plywood which has got virtually no grain or texture on it at all. Um, that's an ideal material, maybe some white maple or something like that, um, or NDF. Any of those materials which have basically have got a nice uniform texture are really good for doing this sort of work on. Now I'm going to drag you in to look at this picture of my ex-girlfriend again um, because it is quite important to understand some of the really key principles of doing a dot picture. This background, which is white, is a very important part of the picture. 
because there are only two components in this picture. There's white or the background colour and there's a dark colour. Now the dark colour is the dot and that's all this picture is made up of. It might look like a grayscale picture or a half tone picture or I don't know what the technical term is but basically to me this is a binary picture because there are only two elements in it. But the success of those elements is the mix between the background which is light and the dots which are dark. Your eye and your brain are very good at ignoring the fact that they're dots and it does a palette colour mix and creates this grayscale effect. So what I'm really getting to is the fact that it is very important the ratio between the dots and the background and we shall come on to that much more as we get into this process. Having said we've got a white background and black dots there are some materials that work exactly the opposite way around. Here's a piece of clear acrylic for example and as you can see when you etch onto a piece of clear acrylic you get white dots. Now that's interesting because it does mean to say that when you come to produce your picture and we'll talk about this when we when we go and have a look in RD Works you will need to produce your picture and then at the last minute you'll need to make it into a negative so that you've got white dots on a, well at the moment it's a clear background. Effectively you're achieving the same result. Instead of black dots on a white background you're achieving white dots on a black background which is why you have to turn the process into a negative before you print it. I've already got this procedure written out on two pieces of paper and there's some other information on here like all the calculations and uh, the program that I'm just about to use. If you like to write to me, personal message me, then I will gladly send you a copy of this and all the bits and pieces that go along with this procedure that we're going to use today. Well, we've chosen the right lens now. We've also made sure the lens is clean as well. I know that my lens is clean, but you might like to check your lens before you start to make sure that it's really in pristine condition. The next thing that we've got to do is to make sure we set the lens to exactly the right focal point for the surface. It's got to be the sharpest, crispest dots that we can possibly get. And to do that, I've written a little test program. Well, it's not a little test program, it's a little test pattern. You will have to program it yourself. Okay, well this is the pattern that I've developed. And we'll be using this particular line of the pattern to assess the quality of our dots as the first stage. This is a multi-purpose pattern and we'll talk about the other purposes as we get to them. This pattern is drawn on a hundred pixels per centimeter pattern which basically means one pixel is 0.1 of a millimeter. So the pixels are 0.1 and the gaps are 0.1 and the reason I've chosen 0.1 is because it's typically what you'd expect in a two inch lens for the spot size. Now that's the theoretical spot size, i.e. the smallest possible spot or dot that you could produce with a two inch lens. With a one and a half inch lens I can get 25% less if I'm lucky. Now in practice you'll probably find that you won't be able to get much better than 0.2 with your two inch lens and I won't be able to get much better than 0.15 with my one and a half inch lens but we shall see. So hopefully this pattern is also going to be used to allow us to estimate what size the dots are once we've produced the smallest size dots by setting the focus absolutely perfectly. Now it is important that we get our material as flat as we can and as you can see this piece of card is very slightly curved but because I've got a steel base plate here it's very easy for me to just make sure that that card does sit flat like that. Just in case you haven't done them already or got them I will probably include these couple of gauges 
in the, in the data pack. So if you write to me, you'll get programs and you'll get DXF files for making these things. Now, I find these incredibly useful, these little step gauges, because I've got one of them that is millimetres, and this one here, which is half millimetres. So this one runs at five millimetres here, this one is five and a half millimetres, and the reason being, I've just added half a millimetre to the bottom of this one. So, you know, it's, it was a dead simple gauge. And to be honest, if they're not perfect, it doesn't matter because provided you use these gauges all the time, then the correct relativity between them will remain. And so something that says five might actually be 5.2. Does it matter? Because every time you set it, it's going to be 5.2. I've always used my one and a half inch lens here as having a five millimeter gap beneath the nozzle. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to start off at say six millimeters and I'm going to gradually work my way down to four millimetres. So I'm going to take a few readings here. We'll start off at six millimetres. I don't want it tight. I just want it to slide neatly under there because it's very critical. I've got my program set to uh, 50 millimetres a second. And at the moment it's set to 12% power. I told you if you blinked you'd miss it. Okay, now unless you've got microscopic eyesight you're going to need something like this to do the next part of the test which is to examine these results. You don't need a USB microscope such as I've got. You can do the same thing, in fact you can do it better because you use natural light with something like this. Now this is called a linen gauge. It's a 10 times magnifier and it sits above the surface and it's absolutely perfect for examining these. Now all the details on where you can get one of these, like on eBay, price about five pound for a plastic version, but they are absolutely perfect for doing this job. So I'm just going to do a, man a manual assessment of these results. And when we get into the office, I'll show you these results under the microscope. 4 is rubbish, 4.5 is definitely dots, 5 looks pretty good, 5.5 looks remarkably good, I've got separation between my dots, and 6 is not bad either, although I think the dots are beginning to join up just a bit. So I would say that 5.5 is... most of the dots have got a little gap between them. So this is 4 millimetres. This is 4.5. You can just see the beginning of some dots beginning to form just here. This is five millimeters and look we can see some dots coming in. And here we are at 5.5 and actually the dots are quite well formed here and they're compact. If we look here you'll see that there's sort of burning and halo around the dots whereas when we get to here 5.5 we've got nice clean dots <clears throat> at six millimeters look those dots are beginning to join up so that's the reason why I chose 5.5 you can also see from the width of these lines here that 5.5 has got thinner lines so there's two or three signals on here that tell me that 5.5 is the correct and the best focus what I'm going to do I'm going to look at these again on just the 5.5 to make a visual assessment of the size of the dots. Now let me explain that to you. I've already said that these squares are 0.1 of a millimetre and the gaps between them are 0.1 of a millimetre. 
Therefore, if I can get a 0.1 dot, it will sit like this with a distinct one dot gap between them. If the dots are actually touching each other like this, then the only reason they can be touching each other is because the dots are actually 0.2 diameter. Otherwise they wouldn't be touching. And again, we can confirm that by looking in the line above it. Because if we've got 0.2, 0.2, 0.2, we should also have a 0.2 gap between them. So there are two ways of confirming that we've got a 0.2 dot. Now, if there's a gap between these dots, then it does mean to say that my dot is smaller than 0.2, but bigger than 0.1. And so that's where you'll have to do a little bit of estimation as to what your dot size is. But it is critical that you choose the right dot size because it does affect the resolution of the picture that we're going to be able to produce. Now, it's very, very unlikely, unless you've got something like a four inch lens and it's very badly set, that you're going to ever see a 0.4 diameter dot or burn mark. But again, this second row of dots will enable you to see whether or not you've actually got 0.4. Because if you find two dots like this, the touch, on this second row, you've definitely got 0.4 dots. And if you've got dots like this, which have got a small gap between them, and the gap between them is probably going to be the size of one of these pixels at the bottom here, then that represents 0.3. So we should be able to estimate anything between 0.1 and 0.4 size dots with this pattern. So we were looking at 5.5 at for our focus. Okay, now I've assessed these dots and my estimation is they're not quite touching and so therefore I'm going to call those dots 0.18 millimeters diameter. We're now going to talk about resolution of the picture that we can possibly produce with this size spot because this is the crucial thing that determines what quality of picture we can actually work with. The resolution of a picture is internationally specified in pixels per inch. You can get pixels per millimetre but the standard resolution of a picture is inches but we're working in millimetres. So what we've got to do, we've got to convert that millimetre dimension back to pixels per inch. Now there are 25.4 millimetres in one inch. So here we are, 25.4 millimetres, one inch, and we've got to find out how many of these 0.18s go into one inch. And the answer is 141 ppi. So there we go. It's a very simple calculation to get that dimension back to pixels per inch. Now that's the best resolution of the picture that we can produce with this lens on this material. So now we'll go into RD Works and we will see how we're we going to get this number into our picture. Now I've got permission to use this lovely photograph because I think it will demonstrate some of the things that we want to show um, during this session. You can see here that it's a coloured photograph. Now when RD works removes the colour, this is the end result. And it just was far too dark. I could have played with the fairly crude tools in RD works to bring up the lightness and the contrast. But I decided to work on the photograph in another package before I started. And so what we have on the left hand side here is a slightly exaggerated picture. It is a little bit lighter than you'd normally want it to be. It looks as though it's a bit too bright. And certainly I think if you're a graphic artist or a photographer, you would say, well, that is a terrible picture. Well, it may well be a terrible picture to present on a, on a gallery wall, but we're not going to present this on a gallery wall. We're going to convert this into dots and put it down onto a piece of paper or a piece of wood. Let's put a bitmap handle around here and see what resolution this picture is. Still 600. I'm going to first of all remove this picture because we don't need this anymore. So we should delete that. And then we want to size this picture. And we'll size that picture by putting handles around it. We'll close the 
padlock at the top here and we decide on what size we want this picture to be. At the moment it's very small. I think I'd probably like to make that about six inches wide, maybe 150 mil. We've still got handles around the picture so let's see if we can get the bitmap handle to work. Yes we can. And now let's take a look at the resolution. Wow, it's dropped from 600 down to 138, almost where we want to be. If you remember from our previous step, we decided that we wanted 141 pixels per inch. We're now going to set the output resolution to 141, which is the calculation that we made. Apply to source. OK. And we'll click on here. And that's turned into a dot graphic as well now. OK, so now we're going to have to set the parameters for this picture. We double click on here and open up our parameter box. Uh, is output yes? Speed? Uh, well, we haven't calculated the speed yet. Yes, we shall have to calculate the speed. Blowing? No. We'll talk about that in a minute. Scan? Yes. Uh, power? I'm going to leave that at 12 for the moment, but we are going to set that to a suitable number when we get this picture on the machine. It's going to be low and it's going to probably be between 9 and 15 percent because that is the high frequency impact region or the pre-ionization zone that your tube will go through before it starts working properly. And that's the zone that we really want to be working in. We don't want to be working with a solid beam. We want a high frequency beam, a beam that is not stable. That gives us the best results. The interval. Well, we do know the interval because we've calculated the dot size. And that happens to be 0.18 of a millimetre. So we do know that information. The speed, we will determine the speed by using a test when we get back to the machine. But at the moment we need to calculate what the speed is. Yes, we are going to calculate it. Now here's where the magic comes in because this is what we have been striving to find for the past X number of sessions when we've been talking about pixels. And that is the amount of time that it takes for a single pixel to fully form. Now from the work that we've done with the little picoscope, um, I have established that it takes between three and four milliseconds for a pixel to form properly. Now it might take a little bit of a different time on your machine, but I would advise you to probably start off with this number, three milliseconds, and then maybe go up to four or five if you find that it doesn't quite work for you. Um, you won't have the luxury of a picoscope to be able to establish exactly what that number is. But in my particular instance, I feel very confident with three milliseconds per pixel. Now, if you start pushing the power up to 15, 20, 30 percent, then that time will go up. But we're not going to go anywhere near those values. We're going to be staying down at 10, 11, 12, 13 percent power, where the time will definitely be within this three millisecond window. So that's the magic number and why I've put it at the front of this calculation. The first step in our speed calculation is to say, look, we've got one millimeter and we need to know how many pixels there are in that millimeter. But we know the size of the pixel was 0.18 of a millimeter. So we can do that very simple calculation and find out that we got 5.5 pixels per millimeter. Now, if it takes three milliseconds for a pixel to form, three milliseconds times 5.56 is 16.65 milliseconds to travel one millimeter. Now, our speed is set in millimeters per second. So we know how long it takes to travel a millimeter. And we know that one second is a thousand milliseconds. So if we take a thousand milliseconds and find out how many 16.65 milliseconds there are, we should find that we can run at 60 millimeters a second and still allow ourselves three milliseconds per pixel. So now we can go back into our bitmap 
and we can set our speed to 60. And the only unknown that we've got at the moment is the, is the power. And we'll go back onto the machine and we'll look at how we're going to define the power. Now, the one thing I nearly forgot to do is that green dot there. We need to go up to config and we need to change that dot from the top left hand corner to the bottom left hand corner in my particular instance. If you happen to be working up here at the right hand corner as a datum, then I would put it down at the bottom right hand corner, but down at the bottom somewhere. Um, and I'll explain that when we get to the machine. We've already determined that from our dot size, which is 0.18, the best resolution picture that we can work with is 141 pixels per inch. Now you may decide to ignore that and say, so I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll get a better quality picture if I go up to 282. Let's just double it for example. Well, here I've got a picture which is 282 pixels per inch. Okay, now these dots are obviously 0.9 of a millimetre diameter because we've got twice the resolution. But hey, we can't get 0.9 dots. We're going to put 0.18 dots down on that pattern. And here's what's going to happen when you put 0.18 dots on a pattern that's too tight. You might say that's a bit of a mess. Well, yes, you're right. It is a bit of a mess. But what you can see is different densities here of the color. This is very dark and dense, and this is a mixture of densities here. Can you see that? You know, and then you've still got a little bit of white, but of course that white is nothing like the white that we had on the original picture. The white in the original picture was that. Well, where's it all gone? It's been hidden by big dots on a tightly spaced pattern, 282 pixels per inch. And let's zoom in and have a look at what's actually happening. Here we've got our 0.18 dot sitting on top of a 282 pixel per, per inch pattern. So at the moment, yes, it works. But look what happens. These big pixels are overlapping. And as they overlap, it means I'm going to get a double burn here and a double burn here. And I'm getting loss of white space between my pixels. So we're going to get a tremendous amount of overburning, repetitive burning on single dots. Now that's going to create extra depth of burn. And this is why you get a 3D feel to your picture. If you get the dot spacing wrong and you get your dot sizing wrong, you will produce a 3D feeling picture. It's not 3D. What it is, is just caused by the fact that you overburnt the material and you've gone deeper and deeper and deeper with every one of the burns that you put on these dots. So that's why I'm emphasizing to you and I can't emphasize it enough. Don't veer away from these rules. Well, we're back to our test pattern again now, because what we want to do now is to determine what power we're going to be using. OK, so we're going to run one, two, three, four. We've run six tests. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the relative darkness of these dots, single dots, to these dashes. Now, these dashes are multiple pixels. And with multiple pixels, you don't have the same problem. With a single pixel, what's got to happen in the time scale, we've got to build up to maximum power and drop off again and produce a black dot. Whereas here, what we're really trying to do is do exactly the same thing, produce the same depth of burn like this. If you get the power wrong, what will happen is these here will go up like that and they will never make full power but these will because what they'll do after the first pixel which is what we've got there the first pixel they will carry on and they will go to the full depth 
So what we're trying to achieve is this effect here, where we've got the same depth of burn on a single pixel that we have on multiple pixels. And partly that will be determined by the power. So what we're basically trying to aim for is the lowest possible power that we can and get matching coloured lines and pixels. Now I know it sounds a strange concept, but when you see the results of this test, you'll understand what I mean. The other important thing to do is we've already calculated the speed that we need to run this test at. And if you remember, 60 millimeters per second. So what we're going to do, we're going to run our test now at 60 millimeters a second with these various powers on it. Now, before you can even go near that with a magnifying glass, um, I think you can see how the power is changing and it looks as though we get colour that matches at around about 11% power. Now, I'm going to put this under the micro, I'm going to put this under my magnifying glass and have a look at it, but we'll also take a look at this under the microscope so that you can see for yourself. My visual assessment says that 12 is the best balance between the dots and the lines. Yeah. I think you can see without any shadow of doubt we haven't got anything decent colour here at 9% and certainly the dots and the lines are not the same colour. We go to 10%, no. 11%, no. You can see the dots are still pretty pathetic and weak in relation to the uh, dashes. 12? Well, looked at under this microscope, 12 doesn't look all that good. In fact, I would say that probably 13 or maybe 14 gives a far better match. Well, there's another piece of information that might help me here. If I look at the dots on this bottom line, they are more joined up than they are at 13%. 13% gives a much cleaner set of dots. So I think at the end of the day, 13% should be the number. Now I know this all sounds very calculated and fiddly, and that there's no art in this anymore. What I've done, I've removed the skill level from it by showing you a method by which you'll be able to achieve good results. Now, Am I going to fall flat on my face when we produce the picture? That's the next stage. So we've now decided that we can finally set the power parameter. So I'll load my program in. I've got my datum set down here. So I need to move my head down to that bottom left hand corner. And I said I'd let you know why I've done that. I'm going to make sure I turn my air assist off. I know that there's enough air leakage through that valve to make sure the lens doesn't fog up. And what's going to happen is I'm going to close the lid, which is very unusual for me. But once this is running, I'm going to close the lid because I need a cross flow. Bear in mind, I've got a steel table on here with no holes in it. And my air has got a tendency, occasionally it will creep down the side here, but most of it is going down the back of the machine. It's busy sucking out to the back of the machine. So there will be a cross flow of air over the top of the table. And that's what I want to happen. As the smoke comes off of the surface, I want it to be wafted away and drawn back. Now, if it gets drawn back and for some reason or other decides it wants to condense on this lovely white paper and make it brown, well, it's not going to worry me because my picture is now starting at the bottom and so everything that I leave behind is going to have clean air passing over it and when I get to the end of the picture I'm going to have a pristine result. I hope I'm going to knock your socks off with the results of this. Enough talking, let's get on with it but we'll have to close the lid and walk away because it's probably going to take an hour to do this picture. It's not a fast process. And away we go. You can see the air drifting up and wafting back at the moment. 
There we go. I've opened the lid up a little bit more so you can see it. And there's still a good cross flow across there, but when I close the lid down, it will really zip out of there. Well, it took about an hour to do, but um, here's the end result. Now, the real test to me is whether or not I can feel any 3D-ness. There's nothing around there at all. That black is just a little bit sticky. So possibly, just possibly, I underestimated the dot size. So maybe I should have done it at point two and given a little bit more spacing between the dots because in that black area there, that's the only area where there's any hint of a problem. But apart from that, I think you'd agree it's not a bad copy of the photograph. Look at all the details of these hairs. I mean, her eyes were not particularly bright in the picture, but they're certainly there. You can see the pupils and the irises. So, yeah, I think I'm pretty pleased with that. What I did today wasn't really a fluke because a couple of days ago I did some uh, similar work on the light blade machine and here's the result that I got with a two inch lens and here's what happened when I changed to a one and a half inch lens with exactly the same speed settings and power settings two inch lens one and a half inch lens still a good picture softer, less power going into the dots. So with the one and a half inch lens I can get more density, more power density into each dot. Well as I've shown you the rust formula seems to work with two different pictures, three lenses on two machines. Well if you're going to try this for yourself I'm pretty confident it might work straight out the box but if it doesn't I've explained everything and you've got an idea where you might be able to tweak a few things here and there. So enjoy yourself, waste a lot of time and I'll see you in the next session. Bye now.